Now we're taking a totally different tack. We're going to move to England. And as you know, Joy has told you about expanding the DNA project. We had previously had, was it three or four GANs from England? Uh, three. Three GANs from England. Uh, Jeffrey, Derek, and Peter, who had been tested. And they had matched the GAN haplotype. So we knew for sure. Jeffrey, Derek, and Robert. And Robert. Thank you. And Joy, in the last year, has made a concerted effort and convinced several additional English GANs to be tested. And the results from that have been quite surprising and interesting. We started about, uh, what, five, six years ago working on the paper side of it, working from what Jeffrey GAN knew. He had gotten his family back to a couple named William and his wife Jane Marriage. So we did a project because Jeffrey's line was concentrated in Essex. And we felt, OK, that's probably where the family is from. That's where our immigrant came from. And we thought at that time that the immigrant probably was an early Samuel. A number of us, several of you here in this room, gathered in Salt Lake City. And we spent a week at the Family History Library. Chris is nodding. Chris's eyes were just, oh, worn out from this. <laughs> <laughs> as were everybody else's. We spent a week reading page by page on microfilm English parish registers from Essex. We took a, a chart of all of the uh, parishes, a map of the parishes, and we divided it up and everybody tackled it. And we were looking for the couple we felt would have come to this country and seeing them disappear from that register. Never happened. We didn't find a match. We did find quite a few random GANs. And then Bill and I continued and worked on it for quite a bit more on our next few trips. And we added more to it. And eventually, we pushed Jeffrey's line back from what he knew back another four generations. So the, uh, the William that Jeffrey knew as his earliest ancestor, we found was the son of Robert and his wife, whose name we were never able to discover. And Robert died in Hertfordshire, but we were still from Essex originally. And his father, Robert, had a pretty good-sized family, including the Robert we just saw. And he was from Lincolnshire. And here you have an even bigger generation, going back one generation further, but this is all in Stamford, Essex. All of these, Lincolnshire. Lincolnshire, excuse me, except the first child was born in Bern. And you'll see several familiar sounding names. Peter died young. Most of the rest of these, as far as we know, lived to adulthood. And we'll talk a little bit further about that in a moment. Bill now wants to interrupt me. Yes. Are we going to let him? Yes. All right. Look here. The, the old boy died in 1603 in Lincolnshire. So what's that tell you when he was born? In the mid-1500s. 1550, 60. Because look, he's, he's married in 78, so 20 minus 78 is 58. So therefore, 1750 to 55 would be his normal birth year. He's having all these children, okay? They match. They're the same DNA. That's right now you're looking at our most common ancestry in England. There he is. Now we're going to show you even more proof in a minute. And we've been extremely fortunate that we have pushed past the period of the interregnum with all of the missing or destroyed records. We've gotten through the English Civil War period we came through intact and found the generations to get back to this point, we could still theoretically, if the family appears in the records that survive, we could go back another three to four generations in the parish registers which start in 1537, 1538. So we still have prospect of pushing the line back a little further with the parish records. Okay, so this is then just a quickie summary of Jer Jeffrey, who just died, by the way, two months ago, unfortunately. This is his, his this, line. This is as far back as he knew. 
and we've gone on back to this point. And as I mentioned, the one son, Peter, who died in that one generation, but the rest of those sons lived and had lines that came down. Going generation by generation, as you can see, we have multiple prospects of men who, as far as we know, made it to adulthood and probably established families and had the Gann name in Lincolnshire. And again, in the next generation, here too, what we've done is we just went back through each one of those family groups and we removed the ones that we knew died young. And we've show, we're showing you the other males who probably left progeny, bearing the name. And the next one? Well, hang on a minute. Oh, for, okay. For example, look at this William, born in 1634-35. He could have been the one who came over later. See? He could have been related to Clement. So we, we don't know, but I'm just saying a possibility because of the name and the time period. Now remember, the one who was transported in 1673, 1673, he would be about 40. A mature man, but able to make his own way at that point. And this could well be the William who came. Possible. Something else to think about. Bill talked about the fact that Clement showed up Oh, in 1660, and in 1673 you have William coming, and he thinks, you know, communication back and forth. There's another possibility. He came as a headright. A headright means someone else paid his passage in order to claim the land that was being awarded for each person who came in. And the people who had the money and were paying the passage and bringing these people over so they could claim the land, 50 acres usually for each person they brought in. They would go back to the same locality to recruit people to bring over. They, in other words, they're working from the same pool. So it would be natural they might get a couple of Gans who are willing to come. And they may not be that closely related, but they're in that same area because this person goes back to recruit in the same area and get more people to come. Or he may have an agent over there lining up people that he can pay the passage for or some of these people who got the head rights never came over themselves. They were over in the old country, and they were paying and sending people over here and claiming the land and speculating on it over here without ever setting foot on it. You want to do this one? Well, okay. In other words, uh, at this point, you know, we really... This is what those previous slides are all about. Yeah, we're, we're really looking at some of these other people who could be <coughs> immigrants or their sons could be an immigrant. So that's, you know, that's in this pool of people out there that we've just showed you. Next. And, wait, oh, just a minute. Remember, we've talked several times, and Thea also, about names and certain unique marker names coming down and how those can give you ideas or direction in your research. And we've talked a lot about Clement and Ignatius and the fact that those names are usually associated with Catholic families. If we have a Catholic family, we're not going to find them in the records during the time that they're Catholic because those parish registers are Church of England and Catholics are what are called nonconformists and they had their own separate records which may or may not be preserved. Um, here's a couple more generations you see coming on down that could have had a son who could have come over. Next. Here's the last one we just showed, uh, Philip and s from Stanford Rivers at that time period. It's a little late, but the fact is, and Philip is not really a Gan given name. But while it may be a little late, as far as our immigrant ancestor, it's not too late to be the uh, progenitor of one of the other lines that is coming down that has matched us in the DNA. The ones who remained in England. Okay, next. okay so now we we did find four additional Gan Gan males who died young, so they're they're out of the picture. And uh, uh, therefore, we're going to have a lot of other Gan males from couples who married and had 
children, etc. So the pool is there. It's sort of like one at a time you have to look at and dismiss. Next. Um, we've only been looking at Jeffrey's direct line at this. Now remember, Jeffrey's direct line has uncles over here. They had sons, and they had sons. And we've never tackled those lines. So if, if somebody wants to jump in, great. I'll send you names next. So to date, as, as Joy has written... Uh, he's, he's shifting gears here, and he forgot to announce that. Okay. Uh, approximately 175 individuals have been tested in our ongoing DNA uh, Y chromosome project. And that's how we got started, and that's how we began to build the original GAN haplo group bunch. And then others who were tested who didn't match but had the GAN name, on paper, we could tell you how they were connected. A lot of them came from a GAN, a single GAN lady who had a child out of wedlock but named the child her maiden name. Okay. Now, out of this, out of this, 66 belong, and they're back here in white. If you go back on the chart on the wall, that those two white sections are these 66 men. Next. That's on the big 12-foot long chart. And as David this morning de defined for you, a haplo group here we said is a genetic population. That means a bunch of people. It could be chickens or rabbits or whatever, but we're talking about people at this point who share a common ancestor. Think of it this way. You know, my mother used to raise chickens when I was a little boy, and she would have the Rhode Island Reds. Rhode Island Reds. That was a specific chicken. And over here was the white, whatchamacallits? White leggings. Yes, right, right. And Dominic. And so, therefore, you know, she was always rocks. very interested in which chicken laid the best egg. Well, here we are interested in the... In which human has the best genes here? So, uh, and as David ex uh, showed you, haplogroups are assigned letters. And also, as David pointed out, the haplogroups can focus you in on a geographic area. And as you've seen, our paper research has done that and right now has directed us toward Lincolnshire. Right. And it may well be that that's what the DNA is pointing us to as well. Okay. I, I know, I know, I know that reading DNA information is complicated. I go to sleep after the third sentence. But what I want to encourage all of you to do, please, when you have time, go home, open up your computer, and start reading the simple, simple, simple explanations of DNA. Keep it really simple. And if you get lost, start over again and read it slowly and understand it, and then go to the next sentence and read it, and you'll figure it out. And then you go to the next sentence, and you don't figure it out, so start all over again and come back down. That's how I got through college, by the way. And if you want something simple and in small, manageable chunks, there is a mailing list to which you can subscribe on Yahoo called DNA Newbie, N-E-W-B-I-E. And you can get it in digest form or individual messages. But individuals like me who don't necessarily know a lot about DNA can go on there and post a question and ask, what does this mean? Or how do I figure out this? Or can I do this to get this result? And then someone in the know who monitors that list will generally post an answer. Sometimes you get a discussion that will go on for two or three weeks on a topic on there quite detailed.